We'll begin with, as often happens, some comments on lecture 11. So can, if you can hold off on wave equation, if the wave and heat can wait a minute, uh, I always realize that I could connect the last lecture to some very, very important practical issues, even in the linear case. So this is, refers to lecture 11. How do I solve AX equal B? A big, I'm thinking of a big linear system, probably quite sparse, because it's, it's very unusual to have a system of order a million where the million by million matrix is actually filled in. It's usually almost all zeros, but it's the non-zeros we have to watch. Okay, so imagine a system like AX equal B. Elimination on a million by million matrix is not a, not a successful algorithm in general. Uh, so people think about, okay, iteration. Start somewhere and improve. So here's a way to think about that. Split the matrix A any way you like into a difference of two matrices. I'll just call them S and T. So A is S minus T. This splitting is going to control everything. So the, the idea will be to do it in a smart way. Now what will smart mean? So I can now rewrite the equation, putting the Tx on the new side, and that suggests, so this is my original equation, this is my exact equation, but it suggests an iteration. It suggests start somewhere for x0, figure out Tx0 plus b, solve this equation for x1, then carry on. So this iteration then is something, well, so is it, when is this a success and when is it a dumb idea? For a success, we need two things. We need uh, S to be easy to deal with, right? If S was, S will be full size again. But maybe S is like triangular. If S is triangular, then I could solve this system very quickly, right? So I might let S be like a tri the triangular side, the lower triangular part of A or something, and let T be the rest. Whatever the rest is, it's over on the right-hand side. So, my, so one property we want is that this should be quick to solve. Then the other property we want is that the error should go quickly to zero. A and those two are kind of in conflict, and we'll see. So... Uh, Generations, I mean, this has like been a central theme in numerical linear algebra and numerical solution of PDEs. Think of a very good matrix S, a good splitting. Okay, and what's good again? Now, if I subtract this, I d if subtract the exact equation from the iteration, I get the Bs cancel now, so that's good. And I just get a very simple iteration for the error. The error at n plus 1 steps, if I bring S inverse over to the other side, I realize that the key is this S inverse T. That's the matrix. I'd like S to be easy to invert, but I would like S in, what would I like S inverse T to be? What, what are the properties that I hope for S inverse T? I'm never going to calculate S inverse T. I'm going to solve this by back substitution or something simple. But the property, I, so now I'm iterating. This is just like the last lecture. I'm iterating the eigen, uh, what do I want? I want the eigenvalues of this guy to be small. I want the eigenvalues of this thing to be small, I hope. Because the smaller they are, the faster the iteration. This, the, the, I'm taking powers of this matrix at every step. So if it has l low eigenvalues, then that's great. But at the same time, well, uh, what could I do? Uh, one way to make it have low eigenvalues would be t equals zero. If t is zero and, and a is all of s, then I've certainly, I mean, I'm, I've got the eigenvalues all down to zero. But what happens, what does that choice mean? If, if t is, yeah, s is a, and, and that's where I started. Right, that's where I started. So the, the trick is, you know, get some of S, some of A into S, 
enough to get this eigenvalues down pretty far, but still keep it fast to solve. And, and there's so many suggestions have been made, and the words like preconditioning and so on are all, and, and successive over-relaxation, I don't know if you've heard of that. That's a particular choice of S and T, uh, uh, which uh, uh, became famous in 1950, and, uh, and now there are other methods called incomplete LU. I, I, I'll talk about some of these. But it's exactly what that last lecture was about in the linear case. Now, having got that far, I can't resist the nonlinear case. So suppose instead of a linear equation, I have a nonlinear equation, f of x equals 0. OK. What's an iteration to solve that? Well, uh, Newton's method is the most famous. Do you remember Newton's method? I'll just jump into it. Newton's method says, take the new guess to be the old guess and correct it by this quantity, f at the old guess divided by f prime, the derivative at the old guess. OK. That's Newton's method, which we could, do, could and should draw a picture so that we, yeah, I should really draw a picture of what Newton's method is about. So here's my function f of x. Here's the guy I'm hoping to find where f of x is 0. That's the answer, f of x equals 0. That's, that's the winner. But I don't know the winner, so I start there. So I start with x naught there. OK, so what does Newton's method do? Well, it figures out what f of x naught is. And it says it's not small enough. You're not, you're not close. So it says, OK, figure out the slope at that point. Find the tangent line and follow it. Follow the tangent line. And there is, when it hits 0, instead of following the curve, which is the nonlinear impossible job, we follow the tangent line and get to a point x1. That's should be if the if the curve if we were if the curve stayed reasonably near the tangent line then that second guess is quite good and then of course we do the same at x1 we evaluate now i guess the curve we we're on this side so we have to do here we follow the tangent line instead of the, look how close it is ha ah. so there's x2 the convergence is, of newton's method is very very fast when it's working well well, I had to say, when. OK, now why is it very fast? OK, what controls the rate of convergence? That's what that last lecture 11 mentioned. Here's, here's our iteration. This is some Newton, Newton guy, Newton's big choice of, of capital F. And x, I should really call it capital X, is the winner. Uh, OK. All right. Now, what controls the speed of Newton's method? The derivative at the winner. Provided I get close. That's, the, that's the, the whole key of Newton's method. If you can get close, Newton's method takes you in like a, like a shot. And we'll see why. Of course, if we start far away and f is just crazy, we may get further and further away. So, so Newton's method is wonderful in the neighborhood of the answer. And now, why is it so wonderful? OK, as you said, we should compute f prime. So convergence, convergence is controlled by, by f prime of x, f, f prime at the winner. OK, so c can we just take the derivative of that? That's Newton's function. Well, the derivative of x is 1. And no, oh, here we have a quotient. Ha. How do I take the derivative of a quotient? f of x over f prime of x is what I'm trying to differentiate. Uh, there's certainly a minus. Um, so it's the derivative of that that I want. I, I'm afraid I'm so old-fashioned, I still do 
the bottom, do you do this? We can all admit it, right? The bottom one times the derivative of the top one minus the top one times the derivative of the bottom one divided by the bottom one squared. Oh, I'm, I'm awfully sorry, that's on tape. But uh, that's, uh, OK. Now, and we're, we're interested at this point. OK, so what do we get at that point? At that point, that's the point, that's the limit point. So at that point, this is 0. This is, now, I'm doing it at the winning point. So what do I get for the derivative? at the winning point? Zero. You see, there's the brilliance of Newton's method. It's super convergent, because he's cooked up his function so in a totally natural way. I mean, he didn't think of it this way, but that's the good way to look at it. He's cooked it up so that the derivative at the winning point is actually zero. So that our, our little graph, the, the, our winning, our, our function in Newton's guy is, it's like, you know, we're, we're just, we're there, well, we're there faster than linear. And so Newton's, Newton's method then, instead of the, next, the new error being some multiple of the old error, Newton's method has the, old, the new error is, goes like the old error squared. The convergence, well, of course, we just use the word quadratic for that. And the reason it's quadratic is the linear term is 0. And that's, uh, so from the point of view of iteration, Newton's method is probably the most, you know, practical iteration there is. And I, I guess I'm thinking that if you have some nonlinear equations to solve, a system, a, a single equation or a system of equations, it, it, Newton's method is, is, is the outstanding way to do it. Yeah, uh, good codes would use Newton's method. They might, as I say, use some other method, uh, some more conservative method to try to get within the range of Newton's method, within the range where Newton's method could just zoom in and, and get it. Okay, and the reason it'll zoom in and get it is that the slope at the winner is actually zero. So that the uh, convergence close, when you're in there close, the convergence is, you know, you, you, if you have 1% accuracy at, at one point, you've got uh, one, one in 100, then you've got one in 10,000 at the next step, and you've got one in whatever, 10 to the eighth at the next step, and uh, it's just three or four steps in your you're in. OK, so that's Newton's method fit into this iteration framework, which it certainly uh, belongs in. OK, now that, so that's the addendum to, um, to uh, lecture 11. And uh, I'll, I'll make space now for uh, lecture 12, where I really want to speak most of all about three very specific equations. The, so now we're here, here we're in lecture 12, and this is section 6.4, I think, from the book. And the equations are the heat equation, the, what I might call the one-way wave equation, and the ordinary wave equation for a vibrating string on a violin or many, many other applications. And then, of course, waves in, in media, waves in the atmosphere or under the ocean are uh, controlled by this or a more complex uh, version of that. With possibly, so the, I guess if I'm really going to consider more equations, I should consider uh, ones that where maybe there's a second derivative and a first derivative. 
and of course, and, or third derivatives. All sorts of equations come up. So what's the point of those? Right now, those are linear. They even have constant coefficients. I could have put a coefficient in there. Constant coefficients. So th we're, we're taking the simplest cases to get an idea of what the solutions look like. OK, so let me take them one at a time. Now, now these are time-dependent problems. So I'm give, I have to give initial values. That's, that's new now. I, I, have to, I have to give, I have to give uh, initial values what they are at time 0, at t equals 0. And in the wave equation, because that's second order, I have to give in the wave equation, so star, star, star for the wave equation, I also need to give an initial velocity. Right. So that's, these are initial conditions then uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for, the, for this problem. OK. Uh, so my, my, over, my goal here is to say, well, what sort of, what sort of going on? How do the solutions differ? And in some cases, we can get an exact formula for the answer. OK, let me begin with the heat equation. OK. And let me begin with u naught. So, so I'll take the heat equation and on the whole line, so all the whole line, but I'm going to put a delta function in there. So this is. So u naught of x is the delta function, the spike centered there. OK. So what's, what's happening here? So this is the heat equation describes diffusion. So I'm, I'm putting, you know, I'm, I've got a, well, I'm in one dimension. It's as if I, if I was in three dimensions, it would be as if I, um, released at, at, at time zero, I've got this little bunch of atoms in a, in a uh, tiny region. And at time zero, I let go. And they bounce all around. And, uh, and tr actually, the, the maybe one point to make is about the heat equation is that things happen with infinite speed that the right now at, at time zero this is t equals zero this is this is uh, the x direction so my solution is zero and a spike and zero okay and let me ask you what it would look like at some later time So this is this is at time zero, the 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 heat, let's say the temperature, is uh, infinite at the origin and zero everywhere else, and then it's it's uh, diffusion of the diffusion of heat is going to be governed by the the heat equation, and any guess on what it looks like at a later time? Yeah, probably at some. A bell-shaped thing, Probably right? That could have the same interval That's right. Total heat will be conserved. Could we even prove that? So I, I, I so the integral all over, all the way along, u of x t dx is a constant. Doesn't change. The total heat doesn't change. In fact, it's whatever it was at the start. And what was it at the start? One. One. So, in fact, it's one. Okay. So that's true. That's an important point. That that uh, the total, inter the uh, conserved quantities are are a big deal in in uh, these uh, time dependent problems. Okay. And and then, uh, but then, what's the shape? And your guess of a bell shaped curve was right on the button. Right on the button. The uh, Oh, maybe we could see why this I hadn't planned, but why how do I see that the integral is a constant? Ooh. 
let's see. I guess, well, if I took the time derivative of this thing, I would have the integral of du dt, right? If I took the time derivative, I'd have just, an and take the derivative inside, it'd be the integral of du dt. But now if the equation is satisfied, so let, let's just see, the time derivative d by dt of this, what should we call this, total heat or something? Yeah, so TH for total heat. The time derivative of that total heat would be, but if, if, if life is reasonable, it would be the time derivative. But if the equation is satisfied, that's UXX. And now if I'm integrating an X derivative, I would get something like, well, this would happen to give me du dx. The, the first integral of uxx will be ux, and I'll evaluate it way off in, in the boondocks here, and where nothing's happening. Where, so it'll be zero, zero minus zero. Right. So the time derivative would be zero, and the thing would be a constant. That's the kind of, well, not... <laughs> not a uh, carefully done argument, but it's, it's the kind of thing that you could, uh, um, it's the kind of property that's really good to know. Okay, but more than that, in this case, we can actually say what it is. And it does, as you said, have a bell-shaped shape, have a bell shape, I guess. Uh, it's an e to the minus x squared over 4t is the shape of that curve. And now to make it integrate out to 1, we have to fix up the constants. There's a 2 and a square root of pi and, quite important, a t in there. That's the, so I could, don't need the 1 up above. So the, you're seeing the bell, the Gaussian. And what's happening as t increases? In near t equals 0, what, what have we got? Near t equals 0, for, so for t small, what, what kind of, what, how do you see that bell-shaped curve? If t is like a little number, this is e to the minus a big number. So what's, what does it do? It, it drops like mad, right? It drops like mad. So when t is small, let's, let's do a t equal 0.1 first. When t is 0.1, it's, well, of course, it's, it, it's, it's, it's got the total area still 1. So this is, maybe I should have done that in yellow. So t equal, t equal 0.1 in yellow has, you know, it's still mostly around the, place it started. But it there's some, well, not much. I mean, I shouldn't have quite drawn it on the line, but I can't draw it close enough without touching the line. It, this drops off real fast. So, it, it, so the message gets immediately out to any observer, but it's such a tiny message, you didn't go to hear it, right? Where a t equal 1, T equal now now t equal one in white, uh, the bell sh the bell has spread out further because it's e to the minus the variance is is that four or the, the variance is that four t quantity and uh, as t increases it spreads, yeah that that's good, and and do you see a delta function appearing here? Well somehow it's it's we see. You know, what's happening when t is at zero? When t is, or very, very near zero? Yeah, well, we saw it. It's, it's real spiky, real spiky. And as t gets is cl closer and closer to zero, we, we have the delta function. Okay, that's, so this would be like the Green's function. I would, again, use that name, Green's function, as being the, the, the magic answer, and it's, it's wonderful that we have a specific formula for it. For when, 
when the input is a delta. The Green's function is, is what comes from the delta. Okay. In this case, the delta is the initial condition. Okay. Now, uh, what if, what if I didn't start from a delta, I started from some other function? Maybe it's just worth writing down how this, to see this, how this delta function works. Suppose, so this is, this is great. This is the particular solution. Now suppose, suppose we start from some, the start is u of x, some general x. u naught, I should call it, u naught of x. Okay. Well, what I would like to do naturally is to create u naught out of delta functions. Because I got this linear problem, if I can solve it for the delta function, then I can put together delta functions and solve it for other functions. So how do I build this thing out of delta functions? Well, we've seen it before, but let's just write it again. This is like I could put a delta function at point A, and then I would weight that by u naught of A, and then that's my assembly of all delta functions. That, this is, I'm assembling delta functions sh shifted over, of course, delta's at different points. The spike is at A times u naught at A. Does that look for, correct? That's supposed to be, uh, I haven't really done anything yet. I, that, this is just the, the way delta functions work. Uh, that, that, uh, you remember how delta functions work? So suppose I take a fix x, and, and try to see why this is correct. So, so I fix the number x, x equals 7. And then what is this right-hand side? It's the integral of delta at 7 minus a times u naught times some function of a dA. And what, what, what is that integral? So let me, I'll just write in 7 to, for the moment. If I have a delta function which has its spike at 7, and it multiplies something, and I integrate. What do I? What comes out of the integral? The, this thing at seven, right? Because it doesn't matter what this is away from seven. The delta function is zero. At a equals seven, the delta function spikes, and I get u naught of seven, which is exactly what I hoped. And that was true for any x, seven, or any other number. So. I'll just call it any x, and I get the x out. Okay, fine. That, so this is just remembering what the delta function is like. Now connect to the heat equation. So what is u of x and t? If this is if this is right, this is just like seeing how the delta function operates. Okay. So my initial thing is a combination of delta functions. My equation is linear, so I can add up the answers from those delta functions. So it's, that's all it's going to be. The, an, the, the answer at a later time will be the delta function goes into this point spread function, e to the minus. Of course, it starts at, it's shifted over, so I've got to shift it, square it, over 2 square root of pi t. And that multiplies u0 of a dA. Well, it's kind of nice to have a, an exact answer. Exact in the sense that, of course, it involves an integral that we can't do. So. So we're, we're here, we're at the sort of like conflict point between applied math and scientific computing, or at the bifurcation or something. I mean, that we, classically, we have nice formula, but if I had to actually find the answer, would I use this formula? 
Uh, well, I don't know, actually. I, I might be tempted to try it. Uh, to do an, I'd have to do something approximate, of course. So I, I might try a numerical integration here. Well, that would be actually perfectly reasonable if I had a perfect heat equation. But of course, if if you start changing a few terms on me, if you say, well, the the heat conductivity depends on X, or if you're really mean and say that it depends on U also, make the problem nonlinear, then of course our formulas are lost, and we're going to be using finite difference methods or some some other related method. We'll, we'll use scientific computing. Okay. So, so there are these formulas for special equations, and, and they certainly are valuable because they show us what, um, they show us, like, what's, what's happening in a model problem. And PDs are complicated enough so that if you can get some model problem that gives you an idea of what's happening, then uh, just the way we did the iteration, we started with, with just linear u prime equal a u equal u n plus one equal a u n. Sim similarly here, we're, we're taking a nice problem. Okay, I, I don't know what more to say about the. I could, certainly could extend the discussion of the heat equation, but I'd like to keep going to the wave equation. So, but having noticed various features here, let, let's just notice some of the features. First of all. Speed of propagation is really infinite. The message of this delta function at time zero got all the way to infinity at uh, every, every later instant. The wave equation will have a finite speed. If I have a wave front, it moves with a, with a speed, and this speed will actually be this number c. That'll be the wave speed, where um, in the heat equation, the wave speed, the speed was infinite. Okay. Another nice point about this solution, this uh, heat equation, is a maximum principle that um, that the uh, temperature is never going to be below the lowest initial temperature. So let me just. This will be obvious. U of x and t. Will, will always be above u0 minimum, the minimum of u0, and it will never get larger, like, maybe I should put it this way, the maximum of u0. Fine, fix this up a little bit. The minimum. That's, that's a nice uh, property. And makes total sense, right? Uh, as, as we saw in Laplace's equation. So there's a minimum, a maximum principle here as there was for Laplace. Okay, uh, other interesting features I could mention. But this is, uh, uh, maybe, maybe just to say here really briefly what, uh, what so many problems of fluid, uh, fluids involve. Like they have the Navier-Stokes equations, so so can I introduce those uh, words here? Fluid flow is governed by the Navier-Stokes equations, and nobody knows whether there is a solution. I mean, it's a really crazy situation that for the three-dimensional Navier-Stokes equations, we don't know if you can solve them for all time. It's uh, that's one of the million-dollar um, have you heard about these million-dollar questions? Uh, it's actually sort of a Boston story. There's a Boston financier named uh, Clay, Landon Clay, who made more money than he needs. Uh, so he decided to keep mathematicians busy for a while. Uh, so he created a Clay Institute, which uh, funds uh, math research. and. And then, partly probably for publicity, they announced these seven uh, outstanding math problems uh, for which uh, the prize is a million dollars each. Uh, did how many already know? Oh, okay, not everybody. I thought their publicity was pretty good. 
because my neighbor said, okay, you know, are you, which one are you working on? Uh, and uh, I probably know better than to work on any of them. But one of them is this, uh, the, the theory of the Navier-Stokes equations. To, is there a solution? The others are more pure math. I mean, Fermat's last theorem would have been one, but it got um, answered before the million dollars got offered. So, uh, <laughs> too late, yeah. She, he, well, he certainly deserves the million. Uh, and just to say, the most, probably the most important un, uh, unknown, unsolved uh, equation in pure mathematics is the one of, it's called, the, is the one about the Riemann zeta function. There's a very famous function of Riemann that just comes up everywhere in pure math, and we know, but we can't prove, that all the zeros of that function lie, it's a function of a z complex. So we know all the zeros lie on a particular line in the z plane, but proving it is so far not achieved. Okay. Well, yeah. A solution has been proposed. Okay. We don't know if it's right. Yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah, that'd be interesting. Yeah, so Los, Los Alamos has, well, you, you probably know, physicists and now mathematicians and others put um, preprints on that Los Alamos site. I guess a priori, I'd have to assume it's not right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, I mean, like every professor, I've, I've got, I've pinned on my office, actually, a wall or, or some proofs of Fermat's last theorem. Uh, and, you know, somebody wrote with a proof, a one page, you know, said, okay, here's a real simple proof. Um, so I don't figure it's right either. In fact, I think one guy wrote again and said, I have an even simpler proof. <laughs> I said, all right, one proof is one more than I'm ready to deal with. But, okay. So this so there are seven of these problems. And, oh, what was I going to say about Navier-Stokes? Well, there's a UT, U, U, well, let's say a, a UT. Um, and then uh, there'll be uh, some, with some coefficient, a UXX term. So this will be, in everybody's language, the diffusion term. But then there's the UX type terms but actually nonlinear, and coming from uh, convection. So we, we, we've got fluids here. And the, the, the point, the small point I wanted to make was this, this number nu is usually very, very small. So that in a lot of practical cases, there is a type of heat equation aspect going on. There is a diffusion. But it's, um, in, the, in the physics of the material, says that the constant involved is extremely small. Uh, uh, the Reynolds number is a measure of, of, uh, of the importance of uh, the, the sort of <coughs> the wave type term versus the heat type term. And uh, when the Reynolds number is large, then uh, then uh, it's a very uh, difficult problem. Yeah. Okay. Now, so uh, let me come back to um, wave equations. Okay. What about du dt equals c du dx? That's an equation simpler than heat. It's only got one x derivative, and we can understand it completely. So let me move to the heat equation. To the to the this I would call this the one-way wave equation. So it doesn't come up so much in real materials. One-way wave, you'll see why. And the true wave equation has a wave that goes both ways. OK, but let, let, let's just look at this guy for a moment. It's a nice, it's extremely simplified model problem. So let's, let's solve it. OK. It we can solve even more directly. So, 
So again, I'll write the equation again, du dt. Uh, that always means du dt, of course, equals c du dx. And we start from, start from u0 of some, some initial uh, position. For example, suppose I start with a step function. Say a step function. Okay. So, uh, the, the, so that'll be the, so the heat equation's going now, and let me start with a step function. So I have a, um, a step, maybe, maybe it steps, uh, uh, maybe it steps like that. Unit step function. So, say our, our friendly step function. Okay, what happens as time continues? Well, it's, it turns out that this has a solution. Its solution is, we can, we can answer this. So the solution is, the, at, at a later time, the whole initial thing is just traveling. It's, it's a traveling wave. It's a, it's a wave that's, or whatever, it's just moving with speed c. So it's the same shape, but it's shifted over. Maybe that's plus c. Let's just check. If that's the solution, we should be able to substitute it and confirm that it solves the equation. So that, well, at t equals 0, we get u naught of x. Fine. Now, so we, the initial condition's okay. What about the differential equation? Well, take the time derivative and the x derivative. Okay, the time derivative of this is what? So I'm checking into the equation. Substitute this function in the equation. Its time derivative is what? Well, it's, it's going to be a chain rule. I'll have u naught prime, the derivative, at x plus ct times c. That's, I'm doing the time derivative here. It's a function of x plus ct, so the chain rule says take the derivative of the function and then the derivative of, of the argument, what's inside. And now compare that with, and the answer will be yes, uh, that I get c times the x derivative of that, which is of course just u naught prime times the, at, sorry, you know, prime at x plus ct times the derivative of what's inside, which is a 1. Okay, so it works. So the solution is just traveling along. So what, what would it be at time, uh, at some later time, like t equal to 1? What, what's happened to this wave? At t equal to 1, so this is, this is t equal 0. Can I graph it at t equal to 1? So I should graph s of x plus t. Now what's the graph of f of, of, of the step function when I've... It's just shifted, right? The only question is, did it shift to the left or to the right? That's the... Let's see. I guess if t is 1, then to get this front, wave front, the breaker, so to speak, if t is 1, then x would have to be minus 1 to be at, at the break. So, so it shifted left, the way waves would really go. So, so it shifted there. So the, the, the wave front, the wave is just traveling here. And it's, it's, here it is at t equal to 1. t equal to 1, the, this, is, this is at x equal, uh, oh, there was a c in there. Should have been ct. So I guess the, tr the wave is at x equal minus c. So it, this, is, this is the way people in, this, in the subject look at, look at this. They, they draw the xt plane, okay, and they put in a, like here's something happening at t, at, at t equals 0 and x equals 0. That's this, that's, this is the the wave, the, the wall, wall of water. 
so to speak. And the wall of water at some later time t equal to 1 has moved this way. So the wall of water is moving on a line in the xt plane. This is the wall. This is the moving wall in the xt plane. And the slope of that wall is what? It's either c or 1 over c. Let's see. If c is pretty large, that means things are moving fast. So this slope would probably be 1 over c. Slope is 1 over slope 1 over c. Because then if c is large, is that right? No. So let me just say that again. If c is large, the wall is moving fast. The wall of water is moving fast. OK, so that means that the wall will, if c is large, it'll get, so is the slope? Anybody, yeah, yeah. Is the slope c or 1 over c? Actually, oh, even minus. Oh, dear. <laughs> uh, yeah, anybody who had any physical sense would get it right by dimensions, right? I mean, the, if we, uh, there's a t over x. Uh, I mean, c, c somehow has dimensions, uh, dimension of velocity. The dimension of the, the units of c are, the, are units of velocity units of x over t, and, and then they would immediately realize what should be there, right? Yeah, yeah, I guess you're right, because if the slope here is a t over x quantity, so it would have to be 1 over c. Right, good. So th there's a, uh, I wanted to just give a name for these. These are called the characteristics. It's a, called a characteristic. And uh, it, it's the, it's the, it's the good way to look at wave equations. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, and with the with this one-way wave equation, the characteristics are just simple straight lines. Whatever is happening here travels. Whatever is happening here travels. No problem with that simple equation. I'm tempted to put in a, yeah, I mean, it's linear, right? Not, not, not too much excitement can happen if it's linear. If I make it nonlinear, then excitement could start happening. Uh, yeah, I, I, the famous nonlinear example is called Berger's equation, where, uh, the, the um, there's a more uh, is another term that makes these characteristics meet each other, and that's then then you get excitement because uh, uh, you get shock waves. So so shock waves occur with uh, with these wave equations when characteristic lines meet. I, 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 let me not try to give details about that without first talking about the standard wave equation. OK, so coming now to the wave equation. So what's the deal? This is an ordinary two-way. This is two-way now wave equation. OK, so what's to say? It's linear. Call it constant coefficients. We can expect a simple answer. It's second order. So we're prescribing an initial displacement like the wave, but we also say what's the velocity of the wave at time zero, right? So now uh, there's a, just a little more input to the problem. It's, it's second order. It's, it has to be Newton's law, F equal ma in some form. And um, of course, when we see uxx and think about earlier lectures in this series, we're thinking we think of uh, our positive definite or negative definite matrices, k and minus k and so on. But for the moment, let's just stay with the derivatives. What we have, so now can I up this to second derivative? 
and I start with a U naught. And what does it do? It splits into a wave going to the left and a wave going to the right. So one half of U naught going one way and U naught traveling the other way. Good. That's, that's what the initial displacement, uh, that's what, the, in other words, this, this wall, if it starts at zero velocity, see, I haven't accounted for the, velo uh, uh, for the V naught part. I've got, a, I've got a, another piece here that will come from the initial velocity. I got it, that's part of the problem, so it's got to be part of the answer. But if it happens to be zero, then I get this nice simple answer. Uh, and I guess I ought to just check, does it solve the problem? So the initial velocity is zero. Why, do, why does this have initial velocity zero? So I should be taking the x derivative. No, velocity is usually t derivative, isn't it? Yeah, take the t derivative. And why is the t derivative of this, of this what, what's in brackets, zero? C from this guy and a minus C from that guy. Great, great, yeah. And when I plug in t, t yeah, fine. Okay, and does it solve so? And of course, at, it, so, it starts from u naught, right? Because at t equals zero, I have half of u naught and another half. I've got u naught. And does it solve the differential equation? Sure. If I take two time derivatives, that'll bring c down twice, which is just just what I want, right? Uh, and also. If I take two time derivatives of this, it'll bring minus c down twice. And so minus c squared is the c squared, just what I want. Yeah, that's great. And now I have to just remember what the uh, term is here. And I'll, I'll look it up to, to get it right. Uh, so this is the, 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 uh, the nice solution to the, to the wave equation. It's, so there's a 1 over 2c in it, and it's an integral from x minus ct to x plus ct, those magic quantities, of v naught of x dx. Okay, I don't know if we want to, let's see. Do we want to check it's uh, at, 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 uh, We, we, could, we could check that it solves the equation and matches the initial conditions and generally shapes up properly. Okay, so that's the contribution from the velocity. All right, so what's the picture to see here? It's to see the wave going in both directions. So in the, in the two-way wave equation, there's a, there'd be characteristics going both ways. If I start with something, a delta function there, it propagates to the left and to the right in the wave equation. And with finite speed. You, you, everybody sees that this was not an appropriate picture for the heat equation. This is, by what do I mean, what do I mean by finite speed? I mean that if I let this wall go at time zero, and I'm standing out here at x equal minus 5, I don't know about it. The, the, the sound, the message isn't, doesn't reach me until uh, uh, a later finite time. For, for, for there's a period of time when the message doesn't come. Okay, so that's typical of hyperbolic, of these wave equations. So, so heat equation, just to write those words down, heat equation, uh, I, I have infinite speed, I know, but in small amounts, of course, 
where with a wave equation, I have finite speed of uh, signals. But then when the signal arrives, you know, I really hear it. It's like, uh, you know, hitting the sound barrier or something. You know, boom, it hits. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's uh, points about, the, about these particular equations. And, and maybe you could let me, allow me to say, how would we study, because this is a key idea, how would we study uh, a, a more general, but I'll, let me keep constant coefficients, but suppose I had a mix of UXX, uh, yeah, and a UX, say, the kind of thing that we, might, we would have in Navier-Stokes. So here's then a fourth example. Fourth example. How would you study the UDT equals UXX plus CUX. So now we're getting realistic here. This is the kind of problem that chemical engineers spend their lives on. They have fluids going through chemical processes going on, and there's diffusion in that, but then there's also a very important convection term, which where, because the fluid itself is moving, uh, they have a term like that, right, and other, other words for it. H how, would you, how would you go about solving an equation like that? Well, the key idea is look for, look at, look for solutions that, that have its constant coefficients, so, of course, exponentials and Fourier things are, are, are got to come into the picture and we'll fill in that picture. But I would look for, look for solutions of the special form with a, with a, with a dependence on, on uh, T sinusoidal, uh, a dependence on T and then some, maybe some dependence on X. Uh, these are solutions naturally to consider. The idea being that from these solutions we can assemble, we can integrate a whole lot of, over a whole bunch of K's and get the solution for a general one. I mean, that's always the picture that, that Fourier told us, that if we can deal with these e to the i kx's. You see what that is at, at t equals zero? At t equals zero, this is one, so we have a periodic start. So I'm, I'm dealing with uh, starting point, u naught is an ex, a pure exponential. And, and Fourier series will tell me how to combine those exponentials into anything I want. Okay, so plug that into the equation. Can we do that? Here's the, here's the key, plug it into the equation so the time derivative brings down an i omega times u. The exponentials don't still there. The second x derivative brings down two i k's, and the first x derivative brings down a single i k. And there is the fundamental relation between the omega and the k. This is the omega k equation, sometimes called the dispersion relation. <coughs> it's the omega k between, omega is, a, is given as a function of k. So now we've got a whole family of solutions here. I now, I now have an answer if I plug in this, this correct omega. So this i, t, and what is the correct omega? I'll divide by the i. It'll cancel that one. It'll cancel one of those. So omega will be i, t. It'll be a c, k. And uh, there's an i still left with a k squared. Okay. All right, that's worth 
taking our last two minutes. So, uh, do you agree that that solves the equation? Yeah. When, when I take the time derivative, this junk comes down. When I took the x derivative, same junk came down. So that solves the, the equation. Now, what's going on? What, what, what kind of a solution is that? In the x, in x, it's just oscillating along. What's it doing as time grows? Well, th right, there's an e to the i t c k. What, what, that's, that's just an oscillation, right? That's just like shifting the phase. That's just like our plane wave, our, our wave is traveling. Just, just like these guys. That, that came from, where did that, where did that come from? That came from the one-way wave equation. But now, what's the contribution from the uxx? It's this stuff. So what am I, here's the contribution from the heat part. And what's special about that? So I've got I squared. It's real. And what, what sign has it got? Negative, very important, negative. So it's a negative, negative, so we've got an e to the minus t k squared. So the higher the frequency uh, in this initial guy, the higher k is, the faster that thing drops off. So high frequencies are diffused away. You know, th see, what's, see, oscillation is like, you know, quick change, but then diffusion smooths it out like mad. So, so very quickly, uh, the, the high frequencies are gone because of, because of diffusion. But the low frequencies, where this isn't so, isn't so small, uh, are still in there. They're battling against the, the uh, sh shifting term. So different frequencies are doing different things. That's, that's what I'm I guess I'm saying that that this simple picture is is now gone because um, different a little little packet of frequencies around some value k is uh, is is governed by this exponential factor. So maybe that's the most important point is that is that heat the heat equation, which I solved by a by writing down that bell-shaped curve, we never saw this aspect of it. And I'll just complete the lecture with that. Suppose u naught of x, so if u naught of x is a combination of these e to the i k x's times some, times some, what shall we call the weight? It's often called u naught hat of k, dk. So here, the initial condition is being split into waves. Then, at, at a later time, again, this is just stuff. This just tells us how much of the wave. But this guy is now, is now becoming, is now the, like this e to the minus t k squared e to the i k x. This is just totally typical of the way you might approach uh, the heat equation. So I just took the heat equation here. I didn't, if I include also this, uh, this one-way wave, then I have to put that in up there. Yeah, we just would shift x to x plus ct. I hope that's like a helpful way to approach so many problems. I mean, uh, and of course, it, it, I, I'm sure that the radar problems, uh, all sorts of uh, um, uh, oscill um, waves uh, that we create, like, um, you know, uh, electromagnetic waves are governed by these equations. Where do the difficulties arise? They arise at boundaries. 
my formulas here went all the way from minus infinity to infinity. I've, I've totally dodged the, the real problems of scattering of waves, of radar and everything. So th those are controlled by the wave equation, but a boundary enters there. So what does the, what does the wave do at the boundary? Well, I, I, I wouldn't, I, I couldn't in a, in a minute anyway, uh, enter that uh, tremendously important, rich uh, area of, of PDEs. So I've, I've really kept this lecture uh, focused on the equation, not the boundary, but boundaries are absolutely central in, uh, in the applications. Okay, so let's uh, today and, and uh, lecture 13 and 14 coming, and uh, um, let's see, I guess we get about halfway through, so maybe 13, 14, and 15, 16 before the uh, spring break. Okay, thanks very much.